Well, I'm hoping to encourage you as I've been encouraged in a study of just the church. We're going to see some letters that our Lord had the Apostle John write to churches. We're going to look at one tonight. He did in the book of Revelation. Instructed the Apostle John to write some letters to seven churches. I have them listed there at the top. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Just as a reminder, church. What is a church? What does it mean? Church in Greek, Ecclesia. It's the called out ones. You can call it out. I put some verses there to sort of help us out. You can call it. it. Talks about how Christ called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. As Paul was being commissioned by the Lord, He sent in Paul to go open the eyes. So that they may turn from darkness to light. Ephesians 5. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Colossians 1 tells us that he rescued us from the authority of darkness. <clears throat> transferred us from to the kingdom of his son and love. In whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sin. The church, in the midst of a world, is just nuts. That, uh, this has helped me because it seems like every time I get in the car and the radio is on, it's some, they're talking about what's going on in the world of some degree or another. Uh, the TV, you can run. I try to go watch something on YouTube, something I can learn how to fix something, and it's in the, on there too. You got just it's everywhere. And I ran to scripture here recently in regards to just studying the church. Just some good uh, re reminders of the church that are not in your notes. Christ purchased the church. With his blood. Acts 20 28 tells us that. Ephesians 5 25 tells us he gave himself for her, the church. It's his church. Other scriptures that give titles to the church, Ephesians 1 22 and 23 says the church is called the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians 6 is the temple of the living God. 1 Timothy 3 calls it the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Peter 5 is the flock of God. Acts 20, church of God. Hebrews 12, 22, church of the firstborn. Revelation 21, 9, it's the bride of Christ. We're going to see tonight in, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, and even in chapter 2, the, book, the, the letter he writes to the church at Ephesus, uh, Golden lamps there. Also, be reminded, he's coming back for the church. It's going to appear in the clouds. It's going to call the church home. That could happen today. There's nothing that's imminent. It could happen. There's nothing holding it back. First Thessalonians 4 16, John 14, 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53 are just three verses, sections of scripture you can study to see and understand the rapture of the church. Even our Lord in our notes asked his apostles, his disciples, who am I? And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Flesh and blood did not manifest that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church at the gates of Hades without overpowering. So if you know somebody's looking for a church, maybe, what do you look for? A steeple? Well, there's, I don't know, many people are building them anymore. Maybe a cross? I don't Who's put, maybe the word church. Maybe you can grab a phone book if anybody has one of them anymore and look up church. But a lot of places are not even called it a church. It's a gathering. It's a place. It's a what? I don't know. So it's sort of different. So here's some guidelines the Lord gives us. He's going to build his church. And it's based upon what Peter just said. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have to have the right Christology. You have to understand Jesus Christ is God. You also have to get that information, not from man, but from the Father in heaven, the Bible. So I put a little, in highlighted there, just a quick little simple definition even I can understand. The church is an assembly of people united in the divine revelation, the Holy Bible, 
that there is a living God who has manifested himself in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself, the Holy One of God, and the only one through whom we can have eternal life. Looking for a church? They better have that. Because if they don't have that, it's not a church. This is what he's going to build his church on. This understanding. Which brings us to the letter going to Ephesus. Right off the bat, chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, This is what the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who's walking among the seven golden lampstands says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot bear those who are evil and you put them to test who call themselves apostles and they are not and you find them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. You have, you have, you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first. But if not, I'm coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So right off the bat, you see this picture of an angel. He said that to the angel of the church of Ephesus, and if you study that, and you, which I have, angels can't, he's calling this church to repent, and angels are not a part of repenting. So a better understanding would be a minister, the elder, whoever was over Ephesus. They're writing this letter that's going to an elder at Ephesus, and he's going to have to read this before the church. He's telling them, that the one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the, soul, the golden lampstands, I put in your notes down below, that gives us a picture of what the first chapter of Revelation gives us, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what this book is all about. He is our great high priest. And I put in your notes here, it gives a quick, I mean, I'm not going to go over all of it, but just, just look at verses 13 through 20. It talks about it. In Revelation 1, it gives a description. When John turns around to look and see who's talking, in the middle of the lamp stands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching his feet. Oh, this is, this is the, the high priest. This is our the great high priest, Jesus Christ, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His hair was white, his wool, snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze. And when I was, when he had made to glow at his furnace, let's see here, I'm sorry. His feet were like bronze brass when it was has been made to glow in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. As for the mysteries of the seven stars, he's sort of helping us understand what he started out here with the book of the letter going to the Ephesians, which you saw in my right hands and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels, and I put like the messengers, the elders of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we see Jesus Christ. This is an incredible picture here. We're thinking about the church and being a part of a church in the midst of a crazy world. Christ is in the midst of these golden lampstands that represent churches. And he's actively involved with this church, with the church, with this church. That should greatly comfort you. In the midst of a world that's just going crazy, we can be a part of a church that's in his hand, in total control. Right off the bat, he commends this church. Just to, just to remind you too, I know John's taking us through the book of Ephesians that Apostle Paul wrote four decades earlier. This is 40 years later, they get another letter from the Lord. And he says, I know your deeds. You know, just to know that. Brings up, I just put just a quick summary of just a few attributes of God. This one's dealing with omnipresence. He knows everything. Everything. He knows your, our deeds. He knows their deeds. He's in the midst, you can see, as a great high priest in the midst of the churches. We also put other attributes. Holiness, righteousness, justice, sovereignty, eternality, mutability, omniscience. 
omnipotent love, truth, mercy, all of these are just demonstrations of some attributes of God. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord, or Yahweh, are in every place, watching the evil and the good. He sees everything. That should comfort us. And he says, not only he sees their deeds, but he talks about specifically their toil, their perseverance. And I started helping us understand what he's talking about. This church at Ephesus, what incredible, what a wonderful thing to be sitting there as this elder of this church is saying, we just received a letter from the Lord, and he starts to read this. This was had to be very encouraging to hear him say that I've seen your deeds and your toil, which means your maximum effort. You're giving max, allowing our Lord to work through you physically, mentally, and emotionally. Perseverance, patience, that's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Despite difficult circumstances, they are persevering. They cannot bear or tolerate those who are evil. Obediently grounded in the Word of God had biblical discernment. And God is commending them. I can't help but think back when the church began in Ephesians, back in Acts 20. That's when Paul was addressing the elders 40 years earlier before he left. And he tells the elders at the Ephesian church to be on guard for yourselves and the whole flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to share with the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage woods will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be watchful, remember, that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each and every one of you with tears. And that's what they were doing. Maximum effort, their toil, their perseverance, they couldn't bear evil. They didn't tolerate it. They actually endured for his name's sake, which means to abide or to tarry, being more concerned with pleasing the Lord and regardless of the circumstance. They didn't grow weary. They remained faithful to the Lord, loyal to his word, remained focused on the work that they were called to do. Then I went ahead and skipped to the other commendation that in verse 6, where he says, yet this you do have that you hate the deed of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans, their teaching, false teaching that that led people to unrestrained indulgence. Self into sound familiar? There's a lot of what supposed the churches today that are into this. Self indulgence, self temptates, sexual immorality under the delusion of Christian liberty. As if somehow you were free to do all that. God says he hates that. It's detestable to him. And it was detestable to the Ephesian church. So it's pretty, that's an incredible commendation. Which leads us to verse 4 and 5. Jesus in his omniscience sees a flaw. And he loves you enough to point it out. This is his church. And he says, but I have this against you. You can only imagine sitting in this church, 90 AD, whatever, in the book of Revelation, when they received this letter. And this church also, Ephesus, was sort of the mother church to the others that were going to the other letters. This one started and the other ones sort of grew from it. I have this against you that you have left your first love. I was reading many commentaries, and one of the illustrations they gave was like a married man. He's got a wife and three kids, and he just comes home to his wife and says, you know, I'm going to pay the bills. We're gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be here all the time and take care of the kids and make sure we've got the food, let your bills pay, but I, honey, I just don't love you anymore. You know, that would be horrible. And that's what's going on here. They were doing all the things, but they weren't doing it because they were motivated because of their love. Christ. I, I was reminded that they driving here in the Old Testament when they would cross a river a lot of times if you're studying the Old Testament you'll see the Lord would tell them take some stones from the river and pile them up there. Doing that so they would never forget what went on. And, if, and There is a generational thing. I don't know what it is but 
it seems like the first generation Christian in a family is usually on fire and excited and sharing with everybody and making sure Grandpa knows and getting him a Bible. Then that second generation comes along. It's like uh, you're going to work and you're not praying for the people you're working with. Be sharing with Joe at work, and they're like, they're like, like they don't even know that's something they should do. Like what? It's just, it's just that second. The generations, and here we are, 40 years later. After the Apostle Paul, Apollos, Aquila, Priscilla, all these incredible people that were involved at the beginning of this church in Ephesus 40 years earlier, and you're seeing they've lost their first love. Verse 5, therefore remember where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, but if not, I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. I put some verses in here. For the Lord said in Matthew 10, 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of That should make you sort of stop and think, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about he should be the preeminent one. Your love for him should supersede everything. If you've let something slip in to your life that takes the love of Christ out, you've put it in something else, you've lost your first love. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross, follow after me, is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Love for Christ should be superior. also put in your notes just as a reminder that God disciplines his children. This is a church. His church, his, cal his golden lampstand, the church is there in Ephesus. So he's pointing things out that they need to do. Correcting. First, I mean, Hebrews 12 tells us that, that God deals with us as sons. What father doesn't discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. What he's saying, if you are a Christian, you say you're following Christ and that you're doing something, some type, living in some type of sin, and God's not getting your attention, there's a, there's a good chance that maybe you don't know him. I've got three boys, and when they did something wrong somewhere, I didn't have to have somebody at Walmart say, your kid's eating. Or I remember going through Kroger, they had little displays of chocolate, and they thought that stuff was for free. You know, they were over eating that stuff. So I had to, you know, that's, that's my kids, and I'm going to love them enough that I'm going to have to stop and get their attention. And the Lord is even a greater example of that. If you're his child and you're doing something that you ought not be doing, just like he's doing to the Ephesian church, he's letting them know. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's just part of being a Christian. Nobody in here is perfect. No, none of us have halo. We're going to be perfect when we get the glory. Practically. Positionally, you could be no more perfect because you're in Christ, but practically, we've got a long way to go. We say something, we do something, we think of something we shouldn't do, and we have to ask God, Confess it, and he forgives. That's just part of being a Christian. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in you. When a church is not motivated by their love for Jesus, this, this is the downward slide. This is what can happen. A lack of interest slash concern for the truth by What's, what's the pastor preaching this morning? Is it out of a newspaper or a magazine or the headlines? Or maybe we could have uh, the Secretary of Defense come speak. Somebody. You know, what? No. That's what happens. When your love for Christ, indifference towards others, love for the world comes in, compromise is made with doctrine that God hates, eventually to the point where he removes the lampstand. I also put in there 1 Corinthians 13, 
course, the Corinthian church was a mess. If you remember, it started off the Lord through the Apostle Paul's call and babes, infants in Christ. It takes all the way to chapter 13 where he can start trying to help them understand what love is. But in doing so, he lets them know in their showy, fleshy mentality of gifts, if you speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but you don't have love, you're just a claiming symbol. So without love motivating you in our church, why you come, why you're involved, what you're doing, while we're here, it's not because you love Christ. It could be because you lost your first love. And he's calling this church, and he would be calling us all to repent. Repent. Remember, he says, remember where you've fallen. Remember, Jim, when you first got saved and you couldn't wait to go to work and share with people? Matter of fact, I can remember as a young Christian, I bought people that I didn't really know well Bibles. Had their name put on them. I was sort of a nut. You know, I didn't know what I'd give I didn't know what was good. What are you giving me a Bible? And I was like, yeah, do you have one? I just re repent, Jim. Remember the way you were on fire in the beginning? Have you ever been around a campfire? Somebody take that red hot coal and sort of sits it out the side and just sort of goes out. Get back in there. Like you were when you were first saved. Get excited, looking for opportunities to share. Read your Bible, pray, repent, and do the deeds you first did. So remember, repent, and return. That's what he's calling this church at Ephesus to do. Is that if they don't, they remove that lampstand. They won't be a church anymore. It might look like a church, but they won't be. We got enough of those, don't we? Church on every corner. I was also reminding myself today, the church is not a collection of people who gather to hear a motivational speak. That was one of the persons in the new members class this week that said that's what he was experiencing visiting churches. He wasn't hearing a sermon, he was hearing a motivational speak. The church is not a collection of people who are seeking advice for living their best life now. The church is not a collection of people who want to feel spiritual church is not a collection of people who want to feel sentimental about Jesus, a Jesus undefined by the scripture. A lot of people say they believe in Jesus, but they can't tell you who he really is. And upon this rock, as Peter was told, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what he's going to build his church on. Which leads us to verse 7. Christ says, he who has an ear... I went to the ear, nose, and throat guy the other day. Got big charts on the wall of an ear. I don't have ever looked at an ear. But I was thinking what I said, the things you don't know that you don't know. But a lot about my ear, I didn't know. It's amazing how somebody could be an ear doctor and not know the Lord is beyond me. But the ear. He's not saying if you have an ear. I've noticed we all got ears. He who has an ear, spiritually awakened person who can hear what's being said, let him hear. What the, script, what the Spirit says to the churches, to, who, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The church, the called out ones, in your notes there, are reminded of the command to take heed of the Scripture. He who has an ear, let him hear the Word of God. I put in there 1 Peter chapter 1. They talk where Peter's telling them, since you have become obedient to the truth, he's encouraging these. If you study that section of Scripture, 1 Peter, these people were under heaven persecution. Since you have been obedient to the truth, purified your souls by the love of your brothers without hypocrisy, fervently loving one another from the heart. For you have been born, again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, that is, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all flesh is like grass. And all its glory, like the flower of the field, the grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of God endures forever. And this is the word which was proclaimed to you as good news. Therefore, that's why the therefore is therefore. Mm -hmm. Lay aside all malice, that's just general wickedness, all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Before you can come to the word of God, you've got to set stuff aside. You can't just rush into church and think somehow you're going to worship the Lord. You need to ask him, Lord, is there anything that I need to confess and repent of? Back to 1 John 1.9. 1 
And like newborn babies, we should be longing for the pure milk of the word so that by it we'll grow in respect to salvation. If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord. So hear. He who has an ear, let him hear. To him who overcomes. Overcomes. Reminds me of another letter that John wrote. Not only did he write Revelation, but he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. How about 1st John 5, 5? He who he who is, who is he who overcomes the world? It's like a question. But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You want a definition of an overcomer? A believer. It's a gift from God. God graciously opened your, made you alive so you could see your sin, granted you the faith to believe. And if you are a believer, you are an overcomer. So to him who overcomes, you're going to, if believers overcome. I will grant to eat the tree of which is in the paradise of God. Eat of the tree, referring to eternal life. The paradise of God is talking about heaven. I was reminded also just a few verses after our understanding of what an overcomer is. 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So these people aren't doing, are not trying to overcome things in hopes that maybe they can earn something. An overcomer is a believer, and you will. So in summary, motivated by our love for Jesus Christ, I can't help but tell you of the greatest commandment. You've got a scholar of the law comes to Christ testing him, teach you what is the great commandment in the law. Love, you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I heard R.C. Sproul say one time, who's done that for more than 15 seconds? It makes you think, doesn't it? It really makes you evaluate yourself. Lord, help me. John 15 says we can do nothing without Christ. Boy, do we need him. Help me to be right with my thinking. Help me to think of you and love you and, and be more concerned with pleasing you because of what you've done and who you are. And my love for you should be supreme. And when it's not, tell me, like you've told the Ephesian church. Love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is, it says, like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So when you're motivated, when we are motivated because of our love for Jesus Christ, the church will put Jesus on display. As he or as it grows in greater degree of faithfulness, loyal commitment to his word. You can agree with 2 Corinthians 5, it should be our aim, our ambition to be well pleasing to him. Because we love him. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. So I, I just hit again with another little simple gem definition of church. The church is an assembly of redeemed people. Redeemed through faith in the true Christ. It is an assembly of people called out of darkness into his marvelous light who are united and motivated by love and the biblical truth that clearly teaches Jesus is God, is Lord, Savior, and Redeemer. That is the definition of the church. You think, well, why did he create it? What are we here for? Well, Ephesians 1, 3 talks about how he, before the foundation of the world, he chose who was going to be his part of his church. And it says it's according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of of the glory of His grace. So when we are motivated by love of Christ in everything we do, and when we, we're not, we repent and we get back on, we're bringing praise and glory that He desires and deserves. Well, I hope that's been helpful in the midst of a world that's nuts, that we can be all the more focused on the church for which He's coming back for, and in closing, what we read that saying earlier, 
I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your church. Thank you for your word. May we be all the more focused, allowing you who see all things to truly take our hearts and show us if there's anything in our life that's in between me and you. Is there anything, job, family, anything that could be in between my love for you? Lord, show me, show us so that we can repent and return and remember the stones that were left on the riverbank in the Old Testament and the things that you did the moment we were saved, the excitement that we had, may we return to that and truly because of the fact that our love for you has been restored. Thank you, Lord, for our time. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen.